Hey everybody, this is the brush lecture and I'm gonna go through um, a little bit about what you should know with your brushes as far as like um, what to choose, what to look for, as well as different shapes and types of brushes. And then at the end of this lecture will be the part on brush care. So even if you already have your brushes or you already know what you'd like to use, make sure that you go to the end and that you're taking good care of your brushes, okay? Um, I'll try and keep it short but sweet. So there's a lot of different brushes that we can um, find, and it's really hard sometimes to understand what the difference is and what we're looking for when we look at these brushes. Um, they're made out of all different types of hair. I've got brushes here that are fully synthetic, like this one, that are partially synthetic, like these blue ones, partially synthetic and partly red sable. These are all um, natural hair, black sable. Um, all of these, including this inexpensive one, these are all hog bristle, okay? And really what you need for the class, especially for the beginning class, is the hog bristle. If you're in the intermediate, it can really help to get one or two soft-haired brushes that will help you with your glazing project. And that's the only project you're going to use them on, probably. Um, so don't go out and spend a fortune on them right away, but... Um, you know, you'll want to get something like that. I've got the palette knives here too, so you can kind of see what type of palette knife I recommend. Um, these are just different ones. Um, something along these lines with the small trowel shape, and it should be metal. Don't get the plastic ones. The plastic ones don't do what you want them to do as far as like picking up the paint correctly and so on. They're too thick, and there's no flex to the blade, and the metal ones aren't that expensive. They're like two or three bucks for one, so just get a metal one if you can. Um, a lot goes into making brushes, and some brushes are made very inexpensively, okay? And you can buy them in packs, like 10 bucks, and you're gonna get eight brushes or whatever. I don't recommend those, okay? Um, I know that it might seem like a lot to buy a brush like this and spend seven or eight dollars on that brush versus this one that came in the pack with like seven other brushes for the same price, but this is the difference. These brushes here that you see, especially the ones that are used like this, I've had these for years. Um, some of these brushes I've had for decades, okay? Like this is one that I've had for decades, since the 90s. As long as you care for it, it's got staining on it, but the bristles are still really soft. It's been cared for, and this is a very usable brush. The difference with um, something like this, the ones that come in packs or the really inexpensive ones they sell at the hobby stores, is that they um, are made so cheaply that they might not even last the painting, one painting. I've had people in there that thought they'd just outsmart me and they get these brushes and they get partway through a painting and then the brush is already destroyed with bristles going every direction. So let me kind of point out some of the differences of like a good quality brush versus this cheap brush. Hopefully you can see the difference like in the thickness of the brushes, how thin this one is and how little hair it actually has compared to something like this that has a lot of thickness to it, okay? There's strength in numbers, so the more bristles that you have, it's actually gonna, it stands a better chance of not getting damaged, of the bristles not getting damaged. And if you damage a bristle, you can just clip it off near here. You don't wanna ever pull it out, but you can clip it off and the rest of your brush remains intact and you really haven't lost that much because a brush like this, you've got more like, you know, a couple hundred or 300 or 400 bristles, whereas this one, you've got like 50, okay? So you lose one of these, it's a big deal. You lose one of these, it's not such a big deal. So that's one thing. The other thing, I'm going to pick up one, a couple of these bigger brushes so you can see it better, is you'll notice the way that the end of the brushes are. You'll notice that this is what we call, these two right here are both flats. They're basically the same bristle type shape. Actually, this is a bright um, it's a shorter version of a flat, but they're basically supposed to be, be the same shape. But you'll notice that as we look at the top of this brush, that the hairs are finer and that they come together and they kind of naturally curl in a little bit. There's a couple little split ends because this has been riding around in my box for a while um, here with all the other brushes. So it's gotten a little bit wonky, but basically this brush is still like almost a new shape and this one as well. So what happens is when somebody's making a cheap brush like this, they take a uh, much less quality hair, uh, it's a much lower quality hair, I should say, um, and they put it in the ferrule, that's what we call this metal part, it's called the ferrule, 
and then um, they just cut it off to make that in. They trim it, and that makes that nice square in. It looks really good when you first buy it. And then the second you get it wet, the more you work with it, especially as you start putting pressure against it, those bristles just decide whatever way we wanna go, we're gonna go. They're basically going to bend again away from the pressure that's being put on them usually. The difference with something like this, you can see as I push on it, is that because this was put together by hand and not by a machine, it was shaped. It was shaped so that all the bristles come in naturally the way that they already want to curve, okay? So when you put pressure against them, they kind of stay because that's the way they naturally want to go anyways. And there's more of them there to support it. And, and then you've got the natural soft end of the bristle because it's the very tip of the bristle where it gets small and sometimes it splits off, basically flags is what we call it. And as it flags off, it becomes even finer. So this end is actually pretty soft down here, even for a bristle brush versus this, which is stiff and you can feel the thickness and coarseness of the hairs. So you've got a lot of things going for you in this brush versus this brush. This brush has everything wrong and it's great if you wanna give it to your kids to do a five minute painting and then you're just gonna throw it away after they've used it once or twice, but really lousy for what we do in here where we're painting for hours and hours on these paintings. Um, these, on the other hand, have lots of bristles, and with good care, they're going to be around for years and years and years. You just need to take care of them properly, and we'll talk about that at the end. Um, the other thing you'll notice are all these different shapes. So I've pulled out a few different ones. These two are both bright. Um, basically, the bristle um, length of the bristle is the same as the width of the bristle, so it's uh, essentially like a square at the end. And my recommendation is do not use these in this class at all, okay? Um, they're very stiff. They have no give to them typically. This one does just because it's so cheap. But this is a, a badger um, bright. This is a badger hair bris um, brush and it's a bright and it's very stiff. And because it doesn't have give, it makes, it makes it a lot more difficult for you to do any blending. And most of the blending you do is going to be done initially with these brushes. So you want to focus more on the shapes that I mentioned, which are filbert and flat. And the filbert and the flat, and that's what these two are. This is the filbert, the one with the rounded tips. And this one is the flat, the one with the squared off. Um, essentially, the bristles are twice as long as the width. Okay, so it's a two to one ratio. That means you've got just a little bit more give here, okay, which when they hit um, the, the canvas surface, they give just enough and it allows you, if you use your hand pressure well, to really do some nice blending with it, okay? Um, we use bristle, the hog bristle, white Chinese hog bristle is what the better quality brushes are made out of. It's the highest quality out of all the paint bristles comes from wild hogs, it's not even from tame hogs, and, um, and that bristle is just a really good quality. And, and the thing that's nice with white bristle is that it's got a lot of strength to the bristle for pushing around a little bit thicker paint, but it's got enough softness here that you can do some basic blending and so on. These are all around just great brushes, especially for the type of oil painting that we do in here. Some of the other bristles that I have here, this is an all red sable hair. Okay, so we use hairs and bristles for these. This is a red sable. This is actually a pretty expensive brush right here. It's really fine and soft. And something like this is great if you're using paint that's really thinned down by medium, that you need to have a very soft, fine touch, or if you're doing a lot of glazing. Um, but it can be kind of expensive. So the ones I tend to recommend for you guys if you're doing the glazing in the intermediate class are these, which are the Sapphires, Robert Simmons Sapphire. Okay, um, they're a mixture of red sable and synthetic, so they're a little less ex um, expensive, a little bit more affordable. And you'll find if you go to like Art Supply Warehouse, sometimes they have like generic versions of the same brush in the front and their sales cup for like a few bucks a piece. So those are okay as well. You're just looking for a nice soft bristle brush um, that feels like you could do the work. The other hairs that I have here. This is a black sable, and there's way more than what I've got. There's squirrel, all kinds of different badgers, which I mentioned that earlier, but all kinds of different. This is a black sable. Sable's a kind of animal, almost like a mink or a ferret or something, and this is a black sable. It's got a little bit, um, this one feels like it's got a little bit of oil built up in it, but it's got, 
um, it's a soft hair, but it also um, has a lot of strength to it. It's a little bit heavier than a red sable, which is a little bit finer hair. And so what I like about these with oil paints is they really allow me to do some nice controlled blending, but they also aren't so weak that I feel like I'm wearing out the brush or that I'm pushing around. I can push around heavier paint with these. So I just really like these brushes a lot, but they are a lot more expensive. Okay, these brushes are anywhere from 10 to like 20 bucks a brush, whereas these, you can find these depending on the size, like this is a number two right here, anywhere from like three or four dollars on up to like 15 dollars. So these are more affordable and that's what I recommend for the beginning class and for the bulk of your painting. And I use these in class for a lot of the painting. Um, I use them on my own paintings for a lot of the basic painting and then I move to these as I start moving up to higher levels, uh, higher layers I should say. The other thing that you'll see that I mentioned on there were to get some fine detail brushes, and those I said to get in synthetic. And that's the one time I would recommend buying those packs of brushes. The reason is because you're gonna use these very little compared to these brushes that you're gonna use all the time. And if you spend like five or six bucks and you get a pack that has like four or five brushes in it, then the nice thing is you have different size of points. They'll have some that are like a little bit thicker like this. They'll have some that are really thin. They'll have maybe a flat in there. So you can get a variety for the same price that you would spend on one of these brushes. Um, you can get a variety of shapes and you use them very little. They're just to like put in this little bit of an edge or hit this little bit of a highlight. So it's kind of nice if you have more to choose from and the synthetic will last a lot better and it'll do a better job at this level. Um, I don't typically recommend synthetics for oil painting. Um, our main part of our oil painting, and the reason, there's several reasons. One is that um, the bristles, they're a filament of plastic, and they just don't have the same capacity for holding the same amount of paint as a bristle brush does. The other thing is to get a good quality synthetic brush is actually way more expensive than getting one of these. They're a lot more expensive sometimes. Um, I've got one in here somewhere. I, I don't know where it is at the moment, but I've got one in here. Here it is. And this is like a $12 brush, whereas I can get the same size. It's a four filbert. I can get the same size of this um, in one of these for like half that price. So that's another reason. Also, um, I just find that unless you get a really good quality synthetic, and even the good quality synthetics do it, you just don't have the same feel for the oil paint, and it doesn't blend as nicely. It has a little bit more of a tendency to leave edges and so on. Where I like synthetic brushes is when I'm working in acrylics. I like to use synthetics with acrylics, but I don't like to use them with oils. I don't like the way the oil builds up in the bristles. They're also harder to get the oil out of later because of the way that the plastic almost seals and it compacts up here at the ferrule, so it can be really hard to get them um, cleaned well. So that's basically what we're looking for. I'm gonna post another document that, that lists some of the um, models and manufacturers, but I wanted to kind of show you that on one of these. Um, so this right here, this shows all the information we need. This one too, but I just don't know how well you're seeing this in the camera. So I'll put this one up um, in addition. So this one right here, this number that you see, this is the size of the brush. And sizes can look quite a bit different if you're talking about um, a different hair. So this is a number six filbert um, sable blend, basically. This is a number six filbert um, bristle. So you can see it's quite a different brush. In fact, this right here is a number six filbert black sable. So they vary a lot. Um, it's, it depends on what the hair is that's making it that helps decide how big or little that brush is gonna be. So, um, this is a number six. This one right here on this bristle is a number 12. Okay, this right here is a number 10. Um, and then the shape, this is a flat, this is a filbert, this is a filbert right here, and they're all written on the handles. So it says filbert, filbert, and flat. Okay, um, sometimes they don't have the shape written on the handle. Don't let that throw you off. Make sure you're looking at everything that is in the kiosk if you're there physically looking at it. The nice thing is if you're ordering it online, you, you're just ordering what you want, so you don't have to worry so much about it. The other thing you wanna look for is, the, is besides the manufacturer, this is Robert Simmons, this, these are Princeton, okay? You'll also wanna look for the model. So Robert Simmons makes lots of brushes. This is a Robert Simmons as well quite a bit different, right? It's worn out right now, but this is a Robert Simmons, and the model on this is the Signet, 
S-I-G-N-E-T. And this is actually one of the brushes I really recommend for you guys. It really stands up to like, you guys are pretty abusive to your brushes, I've noticed. So this is a good, like, workhorse, good quality brush. You can see this is an older brush I've had for a long time. I've done a lot of painting with it. No bristles, no stray bristles. The end is still really nice on this. So these are good quality brushes. Princeton's are pretty good as well, although I think the Robert Simmons is just a little bit better. But um, So Robert Simmons, Sapphire, these are Princeton. They don't have a model name like this. They have a model number. It's the 5400. Okay, so this one is a 5400 FB because it's a filbert, and this one is a 5400 F because it's a flat. Okay, so um, that's the other way that they kind of note it. Sometimes if it's numbers, they'll add it in there. Oh, by the way, this is a, a Princeton as well. So this is a Princeton, just like these two um, are. And you'll notice that what they do is they change the ferrule color, like this is a copper ferrule, this is a brass ferrule, that's what these are. Um, this is just a regular like steel, I don't know, probably stainless steel ferrule. Um, so they'll change it. Um, depending on the brush, they'll change the um, handle, the length. If it's a shorter, it's actually meant to be a closer using brush. Usually it's um, oil brushes tend to have long handles so that you can be back from them. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't use a short handle, really. It just depends on what you're comfortable with and what brush you like. I worry more about what's going on here than what's going on here, to be quite frank with you. Um, so you'll want to look at like the handle, the handle color, like on these Princetons. This is a Princeton that's a 5400 also. It's just a much older one. So basically what they do is it's a copper ferrule and it's got a natural wood kind of just varnished where you can see through. Um, I have another Princeton in here. This is a Princeton. This is a, 50, this is a 6100. This is a synthetic. There's also a 5100, which is a bristle. It's a little lower quality than this one, but it's perfectly good. And I'll put that on the list as well. And it has a green varnished handle somewhat like this one. So you just wanna look for things like that as you're buying them. Taking care of your brushes, let's talk about that for a minute. So when we're in class, the way that I handle it, the way you handle it at home might be a bit different, but this is the way I handle it in class. I worry about the environment. Um, usually our earth colors are not such a big deal if they get washed into things because they're just things like oxides and so on and umbers, which are basically clays. But when you get into bright colors, you have a lot of like pigments that can be very poisonous for the environment, especially like heavy metals like cobalt and cadmium. You've got chemically based pig pigments like thalocyclamine and dioxazine and so on. Um, we don't necessarily want those going into like the environment, right? So um, I try and keep as much as I can out of my sink before I go clean at the sink. And the way that I do that is I don't use mineral spirits typically, and I don't use turpentine unless I'm using a paint medium that I need that extra oomph to clean it out. I normally just use linseed oil. And I have linseed oil in a little cup, something along this shape or size or whatever. And I don't swish my brush in it. I pour the linseed oil in there and then I just dip my brush, clean it off. Dip my brush, clean it off. I do all the cleaning on the rag. The rag can be put, and it should be put in something airtight, like a small flammable, a can or a jar with a screw on lid is a great idea because they are flammable when they have oil in them. But at school, normally we have a flammable can and you guys all dispose of them in that flammable can. And I use small rags so that I can use up the rag and get rid of it. I don't want a big rag that's gonna be around forever, possibly being a fire hazard, okay? So I keep a small rag there instead. Um, Anyway, so I will basically clean it, wipe it, and I can use the oil to clean a lot of this paint out of here. But now, even though I've got most of the paint out, I've got the oil, and the oil will gum up and dry in here too. So I need to get rid of the oil, and that's when I use the Dawn dishwashing soap, okay? It's a plant oil. I don't worry so much about this being in the environment because it's just linseed. Linseed, oil is, linseed is a plant. It's just oil that's derived from the plant. So I use Dawn dishwashing soap, and I figure Dawn is really good with grease and oils and so on. It's a very good dishwashing soap as far as breaking up oils. Um, and they use it on otters in the ocean when they get in an oil spill or something. So if it's safe enough to clean an otter with, I figure it's safe enough to wash my brushes and for me to have my hands in it. 
and it's good enough for cleaning the oil out of my brushes as well. That's my kind of logical thinking. So I do a lot of my cleaning after I'm done with this. I clean it a few times. I'll put a little bit of um, Dawn and then I will clean this really well and I make sure you'll see that I'm keeping the bristles together I'm not smashing them and splaying them out I keep them together and I work that Dawn all the way up and if it's not getting in Maybe it's a big brush or whatever I'll even like pull it just enough to kind of open up the brush and I'll put a little drop of Dawn in there And then I'll kind of work it into the brush Really smash it in there because it's very important to get all of that paint out Okay, when you get all of that paint out and then you want to rinse this really well because you don't want the Dawn drying up in there either. That just makes something else. You got to wash it again later. But you want to rinse it really well. So as long as I've got foam with the Dawn that's coming out that's got the, a tint of my paint in it, I haven't gotten it clean enough yet. I need to get to a point where the foam is just foam and basically the gray is out of it or whatever color I'm using, the gray is out and I can clean it really well and then I rinse it really well and then I basically, a lot of times I'll hit it like this on the sink to knock the extra water out and then I'll basically go from the end of the brush and push out the extra water and then reshape my brush. After I've reshaped the tip of the brush, I leave it flat to dry. I know lots of times we see brushes like this in cups, and that's perfectly fine once they're dry and you're not using them. But as soon as they have anything in them that you're using them, do not set them like this because it leaches down into the ferrule. It fills up these bristles at the end. I don't do that, but you can see how the bristles get filled at the end over time just with paint getting pushed up there. And the more that that happens, it just starts building up. And it's really impossible as tight as these are to get them totally clean here at the ferrule. So that's why we work so hard to clean them when we're done to try and keep this buildup from happening. And this is years of buildup. So I've actually done a pretty good job with these brushes. They don't have like that much buildup to them. But when you're not careful, this builds up really fast and all of a sudden you've got an unusable brush just because of all the crud that's in there. So you lay them flat to dry that way and because you don't want to lay them on their tips either. When these are wet, that's when the, br the bristles are most vulnerable to damage. So I'm worried this camera's moving. So what you want to do is lay them flat. That means you're not damaging the bristle. You've shaped this head here of the paintbrush so it can dry correctly and it's not leaching stuff down into the wood handle and into the ferrule and it dries. If you want them to dry more quickly, just put them out like on your sidewalk in the sun. Don't put them in your oven, okay? But you could put them out in the sunshine if it's warm outside. Um, I wouldn't put them like directly over a heater vent or anything like that, although you certainly could put them nearby where they're not directly in the draft but it's a little warmer air and that will help them dry out more quickly. Um, another thing you can use for cleaning if you want, um, you don't have to use it all the time, but using it when you want to is fine as well, is something like one of these brush soaps. Um, check and make sure this is one that has a conditioner in it. Um, they clean it, you can use it with water, and then um, it has some amount of conditioner in here for the brush bristles. But what I typically do, I've had this little bar of soap for years and I still haven't used it. What I typically do is the method I just described to you and if I've got a paint medium in there, I'll put it in the um, paint thinner stuff first to kind of break up that paint. And then I might use the rag and some oil to keep cleaning it a little bit more. And then I will go to the sink at that point and wash it with the Dawn soap. And then every once in a while, when I notice that my brushes are feeling like a little bit more dried out, they're not quite as soft as I like them when they're dry, um, I'll know that after I'm done painting that day, what I'm going to do is I'm going to condition them. This is just hair. Just like hair on your head, it's just a little bit thicker, it's coarser, and some of these are not. Some of these might even be finer than your hair on your head. So what you do is you can use a good quality like hair conditioner, and after you've completely cleaned the brush and it's ready to be dried, instead of laying it out to dry it, um, I would put a little bit of conditioner on it, just kind of like work it in a little bit, or you can put a little bit of conditioner and a little bit of like warm water, not hot, and don't ever clean your brushes in hot water either. It's, it can be damaging for the bristles, um, but put warm water and then a bunch of conditioner in it. And then you can use it to like basically dip, work, your, work it in a little bit, and then lay that one down for a minute. Take your next brush, dip, work it in a little bit, and then take it out and let it sit. And let it sit for just like a minute or two, not a long time, just like you would in the shower, and then rinse it out really well. 
and you'll notice that once these are, and then reshape them, like I said, and you'll notice that once these are dry, they're really soft and they're good for your next time. And it, it kind of helps keep your bristles in good shape um, long-term so that they don't start breaking early or, or anything like that. Um, I think that's basically it. When you store them after they're dry, it's fine if you want to put them in something like this. But when you're using them, don't set them in this, okay? So I always lay them like on my palette or I have a rag usually on my easel at the bottom and I'll lay brushes I'm using on that and that way I can pick them up but the rag I can just throw it away if I need to later once it gets dirty. Um, so I'll do things like that but um, if you want to store them like this, it's fine. Or you can store them flat. You can kind of see I've got mine stored in this. It's a drawer that goes in my little paint caddy that I've got. Um, so I'll store them in this uh, to keep them out of the way. And um, I think that's basically it. I, I'm forgetting something, but I don't remember what it is. So um, I know we didn't talk about the blenders. So these are the blender shapes that I mentioned on there. This is an Egbert. It's the really dorky cousin of a Filbert, okay? It's um, basically about four times the length as the width. So that's kind of why I think they came up with the Egbert name for it. Not all manufacturers make them, only a handful of them make them. It's more of a, a thing in the English speaking brushes, the ones that are made like in the UK and here I've seen them, but, um, but I think it's kind of funny. Um, anyways, it's got a lot of spring to it and it's actually a blending brush I really like because I feel like I've got a little bit more control. The fan blenders are great too. Um, and the nice thing is you can use them in a wide way, but you can also come in and just kind of hit something on the tip like that if that's what you need to do. Um, these are both approximately medium sizes. Uh, sometimes they're number sizes. This is a number six, okay? And that's more of a medium size. Um, this is a medium, small, medium, large. This is a medium. Um, the larges are gonna be too big. The smalls might not be big, might not be big enough. So I recommend like the medium sizes for these. Um, the other thing I sometimes use for blending brushes is I get these sapphires, but I actually get more of the watercolor ones. This one's got some gunk in it that I need to clean out too. I can feel it's got like oil gunk or something, but they're nice soft tips and um, maybe this one's better, a little bit. Boy, I had to go through and do a good cleaning and conditioning because I did a lot of painting lately and I haven't done that yet. Anyways, they're really soft just like these are and they're really nice for like doing a soft blend just at the very top. The problem, remember, you don't want to use like your blending brushes for painting because that thing that makes them great blending brushes where they get, have a lot of give, that's also the thing that makes it really hard for them to push heavy body paint. And we tend to use heavy body paint in this class because it's a beginning intermediate class. Um, so that's kind of my recommendation is the bulk of your painting you'll do with the bristles and you'll do with flats and filberts and then you'll do some blending stuff with the Egbert or the fan blender and then you'll want to have a couple um, smaller detail brushes so hopefully that helps.